Hello, and welcome to the No Bad Questions podcast, where I try to learn in a conversational manner by sitting down with people who have interesting careers, important lessons to tell, or inspiring stories. I hope that you learn something too. If you want to support the podcast, please follow or subscribe on your platform of choice. You can also like or comment to boost the algorithms or share out to your network to make sure it gets more views. But ultimately, and what I hope you choose to do, is listen to the very end. With that, we'll start today's podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of the No Bad Questions podcast. My guest today is Olivia Dacker. Olivia joined Bon Secours Mercy Health in January of 2016 as the chief finan financial officer for the Toledo region and most recently and currently is the chief financial officer of their medical group. She oversees provider contracting, annual budgeting, monthly finance, finances and KPI performance, revenue cycle, and physician capital planning by working closely with operational leadership in both the medical group and that organization's hospitals. Prior to joining Mercy Health, Olivia served in various acute and professional roles in organizations in Michigan and Ohio, most recently with the University of Toledo Medical Center. Olivia has experience with academic medical centers, not-for-profit health systems, and private practice. On the personal front, Olivia and her husband live in a suburb of Toledo with a Tulane University junior and a high school junior. Olivia plays an active role in various organizations, including high school football and the Daughters of the American Revolution. The family enjoys their apparently large pets uh, with a Maine Coon, a Belgian Malinois, a King Shepherd, and perhaps the biggest of all, an Irish wolfhound, in addition to traveling anywhere possible, but mostly places that are sunny. Olivia, thank you for joining me here on the podcast. Thanks for having me, David. I appreciate it. So for those who are listening who are not in healthcare, which I think is a few and perhaps growing, um, what is a medical group CFO? Sure. So you know, think of really any CFO of, of any type of company, and there really aren't that many differences. Uh, some of the nuances, of course, is we're responsible for the financials of each one of our practices. So as you're driving around your community and you see a practice, those practice financials ultimately roll up into an overall medical group. So these are all of our employed physicians, nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, etc. We also then have providers who work in the hospital who may never set foot in an actual practice that you're driving by. Think of an anesthesiologist, for example. Hmm. We're heavily involved with cash flow, otherwise known as the revenue cycle, uh, managed care or insurance contracting, and various operating KPIs. So we really are focused on things like staff per physician, staff per uh, different types of productivity metrics. Unlike other CFOs, though, we may also be involved with recruitment and retention um, and ultimately compensation of our physicians and other practitioners, functions that typically you would think of as a human resources like um, role. Because there are so many compliance constraints and concerns related to physician compensation, that's one of the reasons why a CFO may be involved in that work. CFO is also, also going to be involved in any kind of acquiring of new practices, lease arrangements, things like that. And then finally, like many other CFOs in many other types of industries, there are various compliance and regulatory components that we also have to keep a pulse on. I'm sure I've missed some, but that gives you a general idea. I think it's a great summary, and it it probably opens up a whole uh, can of worms has a negative connotation, but it opens up a whole array of questions for folks, again, for those listeners who may not be as familiar, or, or maybe just things they don't think about, because I think the American psyche, for whatever reason, still thinks of their doctor as their doctor, not necessarily as an employee of a larger organization, whether that's a health system or a for-profit organization. And yet I feel like this year in 2020, well, last year in 2022, by the time this airs, um, I read an article that said something like 70 to 80% of physicians are employed by one of those larger organizations. So I think what you do is becoming the norm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
but can you maybe educate people some more on why that's happening? So first, from a patient perspective, in my opinion, I don't ever want a patient to think of their physician as anything but their physician. I would want right. them to not think of that individual as part of a much larger conglomerate, except for the fact that if I'm going to be admitted to a hospital or if I have to have a procedure, I have a general idea already of where right. I'm going to go because I know my physician's aligned with that. But, you know, anymore, going it alone, so to speak, being an independent private practice, it's more and more financially challenging not only just from the financial perspective, but the data gathering that's required for things like pay for performance. And as we continue to move more and more towards getting paid for the value and quality of work we're doing versus the throughput, how many patients we're seeing. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of data crunching that has to happen behind the scenes that gets submitted to various payers in order to be reimbursed a little differently. So there can be a lot of legwork happening there um, in many organizations. That's going to be an entire department of people who's managing mm -hmm. those kinds of processes and contracts, etc. There are other expenses, though, that to get defrayed. So um, your INT, for example, every time you have a physician, so you could have, you know, three, four docs in a private practice. Well, each one of them has to have a license for whatever electronic medical record that they're using. Well, just like with so many other things, you get more and more people, the licensure rate can, you know, become less and less. So again, you're, you're taking the benefits of a larger organization, a larger number of people to help defray some of that. So your INT, things like your supply chain, getting better contracts for pharmaceuticals and other types of supplies, again, happens because you are, you're scaling and you're in a larger organization. And then to something a little bit more, a little closer to home, is more than likely the benefits for one's staff are gonna become a little bit mm. more rich. Perhaps there's a 401k matching, perhaps health benefits are a little bit better or expanded, things like that that could be a little bit different. So, you know, the, the, um, there are so many wonderful things about being in private practice. You get to be your own boss. But at the mm -hmm. same time, you are the boss and you're the one who is managing those daily HR like tasks. If you need to hire somebody, if you need to discipline somebody, if you need to do kind of those mm -hmm. negative pieces, you're the one doing it. And that's not what our physicians went to school for. So by becoming employed, more than likely, they get to really step away from those things and actually do what it is that they went to school for. And then finally, of course, we're seeing in many areas of our society, we have our baby boomers who are beginning to retire. And many people right. who have been in, you know, in, in private practice for a long time, they're looking for a way to secure their legacy. They're looking for a way for their patients to be turned over to someone that they choose. Uh, rather than perhaps, you know, just closing the shingle down one day. So again, by joining an employee, right. they're becoming employed by a medical group that helps ensure that legacy. Um, they have a, a sense of control that their patients are going to be taken care of, that the quality is going to continue, all of those kinds of things. So it's really an opportunity in many aspects. It certainly can also feel like one is losing their autonomy and um, I think that's, uh, it's really important to acknowledge that and to give a physician the opportunity to make decisions where it's appropriate, but then to also understand that they are getting the scale of a larger, you know, medical group, health system, et cetera, and that there are several advantages to that. No, that makes sense. And I think that as I'm as I'm sitting and 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 hearing that I I'm thinking through some of the, at least in some circles, the public perception of this um, move to physicians being employees rather than owners, mm -hmm. and I I think in some circles that it gets a negative rap, a bad rap. I mean you've laid out some of the positives and the good things, and. I don't necessarily want to get into why it gets a bad rap because some of the publications or people saying that, I think they have their own interests um, that, that they may have behind the scenes. But let's specifically then maybe from a patient's perspective, if there are any downsides to 
physicians becoming employed? What what do you think? Um, is there anything a patient needs to be aware of, like mm -hmm. how to not get caught in the system or how to pick the right physician for them? Because if you're picking from, you know, three different, let's just stick with primary care, but the local hospital might own three different primary care offices. Mm -hmm. How do you know which one's right for you? I mean, are, are there any things that patients should be on the lookout for? Yeah, there's, that's a great point, David. So, you know, one of the things that is likely going to happen when a physician becomes employed is the amount that they are charging for a service is going to change. It might go mm. up, might go down, but it's going to change because all of the employed practices in that area are all gonna charge the same amount. So there is that piece. The other piece that could happen is if a patient has um, their, their employer, they, they are on an insurance through their employer that perhaps they've always been able to go to their doctor and then once this doctor becomes employed, they no longer accept that insurance. So if that's mm. something too that a patient has to be cognizant of. And physicians really, when they're looking at having their practice acquired, they're mindful of that. They will look to see kind of of their patient population, what types of insurances are they already accepting to see does that align with the health system that they are going to align themselves to? As for a patient selecting their primary care, it's a great question. And I think it really, it depends on so many things. I think it's a, I think it's a gender question. I think that mm -hmm. it's, a, um, it's a, a, um, a generational question. I think it could be mm -hmm. an ethnic question. Um, I, and then, and then I think it becomes maybe a quality of care question. So right. for one thing, I expect, regardless of what primary care doctor I am going to, I expect them to all give me the same level of quality. Their doctors, right. I expect them all to give me the same level of quality. But maybe what I'm looking for, depending upon the specialty. So uh, for primary care, maybe I want somebody who's newer from training because they might be up to snuff with the latest and greatest. Yeah, new new Go ahead. procedures or yeah, right, yeah, right. okay. Or 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 new medication therapies, etc. But maybe for a specialist, gosh, I might or a surgical specialist in particular, I might want somebody who's been practicing for a while that I know that, you know, that they are they're sound in what they've been doing for quite a <laughs> long time. So, you know, I think it really is so dependent um, I know I get through social media requests all the time. I see it through Nextdoor. I see it through Facebook. I see it through you know Instagram. Any of them, um, somebody might move into the community, or their their physician has recently retired, or their physician is being acquired and they can no longer go see. And they ask, they ask word of mouth, and I think that's also very very critical and very important. That's another reason why the patient experience and patient satisfaction is absolutely key too. That makes sense. And I think that when I, when I talk to um, a lawyer about picking lawyers, one of the things that he said was word of mouth and referrals. And I think that's probably still true today for physicians as well, certainly for primary care. If, you're, if your mom, your brother, your uncle, your cousin, your neighbor, whatever, had a good experience with Dr. Smith or a bad experience with Dr. Smith, I, I think that's going to carry a lot, right or wrong, I think that, that word of mouth is going to carry a ton of weight. Absolutely. It absolutely does. I mean, and you see now more so than ever before, you could, you know, when you go out and you, you research, you need a new washer and dryer. You go out, you research, you, you, I know whenever I look on Amazon, I look for something that's four stars and up. You know, I don't, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't, don't even mess around with anything lower than that. Well, now mm -hmm. our physicians are scored that way on so many websites that, again, you can go out and you can look at that, that review and get some real-time feedback and information. I think it's important, too, when you first meet your physician, that it's a positive experience, and hopefully it mm -hmm. is. And, and it's also not just the physician, but the staff and the way in which you got to that point is also so key. If I'm a new patient, I don't want to have to wait, you know, three months to have my first appointment unless that's my choice. Right. And I certainly want to be treated with respect and I want to be treated with compassion when I walk in the door. Absolutely. And that probably could be its own topic <laughs> about, you know, delays and waits and how we overcome that in healthcare. But that that wasn't 
why I asked you to join me today, but um, what? Let me let me pivot from that, I suppose, then to an element of working with physicians. I'm sure is how busy they are, how many uh, you know appointments they have, how many new people they see, whether they are taking new patients, etc. But let me back out from that. Let me let me zoom out and go more broad and just. What are some of the what are some of the lessons learned that the the things that yield successful relationships with physicians as a as a non clinical person by by a financial person by background how do you succeed in those relationships to manage what are now employees So our physicians are from a person perspective they're no different than anybody else for mm-hmm. me, it's all it's it's all about the relationship and you know mm-hmm. getting started on the right foot, developing a relationship, developing trust. But one thing that I think is so important is to be transparent. Um, I think many people are I don't want to say scared or afraid, but they don't want to tell a physician no. It's so hard mm-hmm. to tell a physician no, and it, it it is. But they'll listen to the word no as long as you can back it up with valid reasons why you know you mm-hmm. no doctor you may not get the new state of the art um <laughs> you know space that's uh, you know in the high rise or whatever because it's just simply too much money you know it, right there are the there <laughs> they make a lot of sense they they understand how the world works just because they're clinical mm-hmm. people does not mean that that they don't understand how the business model ultimately works and Mm -hmm. they want to be respected um, and they want you to hear them they want timely communication i think if you do those things and and kind of again respect that relationship it's no different than a relationship you want to have with anybody else whether you're working with or is a, a, a colleague or a friend I appreciate that. And one of the elements in that you mentioned about saying no to a physician from your perspective, from, from a company perspective, from a management, from a peer perspective is important. But when you said that my mind jumped to how many patients are afraid to say no to their physician. You need to have this test. You need to have this procedure. You need to have this thing. Yeah. And maybe you do, but maybe you're not comfortable or maybe you, can't afford it, or maybe you have some other consideration, or maybe uh, ultimately you um, are concerned about the side effects of a medicine. Mm-hmm. But but gosh, I better take it because you know I need to fix this ailment. That's why I went to the doctor in the first place, right? And so it, it, it that's a really fascinating point. I think it's it's true not just of coworker dynamics because I've seen what you're talking about where people are afraid to say no but patients as well and and I don't know how we solve for that uh, again that gets into some of the value and cultural uh, elements of dialogue that we could probably go down four or five rabbit holes pursuing that but I think that is important for everyone listening to remember that even if you're the patient in the room ultimately you've got the autonomy and you are able to say no but given that you went to see the doc in the first place, you, you probably should have a reason, right. just like you said. Yeah, you know, so I have the luxury, misfortune, of being the daughter of a physician and the sister of a physician. <laughs> um, so, you know, the, the one thing that I have been reminded of really throughout my life is it's the practice of medicine. They're human. They're making, you know, and, and and even if the decision to treat something has always been a specific way, every human being that they interact with is a little bit different. And mm-hmm. you're right. I mean, it, even um, we've been working through, we as a, a healthcare society have been working through kind of that double check with our physicians in many different places and changing the culture. And I don't want to say second guessing them, 
but mm -hmm. making sure that everything that we're doing absolutely right by the patient, it is so appropriate for a patient to say, can I get a second opinion? So appropriate. And mm -hmm. I have never met a physician who doesn't embrace that. I personally have asked for a second opinion for one of my children. No problem at all. Here's a person I would recommend for you. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it, so I really do think that um, the majority are okay with us saying, hey doc, can you explain it better to me? Can you explain why? What if? Can I try something else? All of those things. Yeah, yeah. I, and and I, I don't know if that's generational and maybe new doctors coming on board are more okay with that yeah. or, or maybe it's just, a, a, again, a cultural shift yeah. and even um, more veteran doctors are also ha have become okay with it. But I do feel like in my lifetime and even in my working lifetime and my career that that has moved a bit and there is increased comfortability with the second opinion question. Um, whereas I think in the past for some doctors, it had more of like your second guessing me and, and a bit of how dare you type of tone yeah. so sometimes. Um, but so child of a physician and sibling of a physician, are you, this is maybe a good time to start to pivot into the career background element of the, of the conversation, which is why I wanted to have you on. Uh, are you, um, are you then the black sheep? Or, you know, <laughs> no, their eyes? I'm not because my brother is a healthcare attorney. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, and it's funny because my brother and I, uh, you know, when the four of us are sitting down at the table, my dad, my sister, my brother, and I, um, it really can be uh, very interesting. And my sister is 12 years younger than me. Um, and my brother sits in between us. So again, um, generationally, it's so interesting because my sister is one of those physicians who's, you know, come out of training in the last handful of years versus my dad being at end of career. Um, and, right. you know, the way they work, they're in very similar specialties, but the way they work and kind of the, the mindset about, you know, being married to your job versus having a little bit of balance is different. Um, but I, it's really, it, I, I can tell you, I, I have been introduced to physician friends of my father more than once as, oh, she's an administrator. <laughs> you don't want to talk to her kind of thing. So, and of course, it's always tongue in cheek and in jest, but, um, but I know there's a little bit of truth to that too. <laughs> sure. Well, I, it's the, the episode that airs as of the time of this recording, um, I talked with that guest episode um, 19, we talked about is is the business side taking over the the people in the care side. Uh, and so if people want to hear some of that conversation, they can go listen to that one. But it, it's, it's certainly to your point about, oh, the administrators, mm -hmm. it's definitely a trope. Oh, yeah. And um, ironically, I, to me, and, and I'll mention this, and then we'll get into some of your career background stuff is, I think that trope is not necessarily wrong, but perhaps misdirected. Mm -hmm. I think it's the regulators that that need to be the, the ones that get the scorn because a lot of what we have to be the middle men on in, in healthcare administration and leadership is passing along the bad news of, well, now you got to do this thing and now we got to do that thing because somebody somewhere at the state level, the federal level, whatever, said we have to right and some of those rules are good they might protect patients or patient autonomy and some of those rules are maybe not so good or at least not well thought out um often so i i think they're just misdirected scorn so that, that just my two cents yeah i think that's fair absolutely um okay so got a healthcare family how did you get started on the financial track? Yeah, so um, that's just kind of, I fell into it. Um, I was pre-med, as, as one would imagine. So my mother's a nurse. <laughs> um, I was pre-med in college. And um, about halfway through my sophomore year, I said, you know what? I, I, I don't want to be married to my job. I don't want mm -hmm. to be in school for the next, you know, however much longer I was going to do, if I was going to do, you know, residency, fellowship. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to start my life. And my dad literally said to me, what else is there besides medicine? So, it, and then he said, hey, why don't you think about administration? Um, so it, I, I didn't get a degree in administration. I um, actually got my degree just in regular business. 
Um, mm. And ultimately, you know, had my first couple of jobs in healthcare, and it was while I was I was a practice administrator for a residency program affiliated with a hospital. And I was on maternity leave, and um, the director of the hospital's revenue cycle reached out to me and said, "Hey, I have a spot for you. Would you like to come over and work for me?" And that's really how it mm. started. And I've spent the majority of my career than in in a revenue cycle space, whether it's been a hospital or um, in in medical group. Okay, and so many areas of healthcare are female dominated. Mm -hmm. Nursing, social work, um, some specialties of of the physician universe. Mm -hmm. Um, amongst others, but finance, at least based on stats I've seen in my own personal anecdotal experience, mm -hmm. finance is not yep. female dominated. Yep. So ha has that, how has that shaped your career experience then being sort of against the grain or not in the majority? So I, I never, I never really thought of finance as being male dominated. And it's because when I was an undergrad, my college roommate of four years, her mom was an accounting professor at another university. One of my favorite professors in business was also a female accounting professor. And my classes were also a pretty good mix of male, female. So I never felt like this was something I couldn't go into. Um, and then when I was recruited into the revenue cycle, that director happened to a be a female. And, um, you know, I was on maternity leave, so she knew exactly what was going to happen there. You know, she knew I had a newborn <laughs> at home, which um, I think really women in general, not just in finance, I think that is what perhaps feels like the rate limiting step. Nursing, for mm. example, um, there's more flexibility in the times of day, days of the week that you can choose to work. You could decide to do, you know, three 12 hour shifts a week. Not to say that that's any easier or more difficult than working a traditional eight to five kind of, uh, of job. But for me, it, it wasn't so much about male, female. It was about being a parent. And for, for 10 years of my career, I was a single parent. And um, for me, again, that, was, that meant I couldn't always be there at work at you know, 6.30 in the morning, 7 a.m. I did try to be there by you know, 7.30 or you know, as soon as I could be. And it also meant I couldn't necessarily stay until 6, 7, 8 o'clock at night. I couldn't necessarily attend those evening functions. And my male colleagues, in often, more often than not, they could. And mm -hmm. I attribute that to ha them having a, a supporting spouse at home who was carrying that load, not to say that they weren't also carrying it on the off days. Um, yeah. I, I personally was never willing to sacrifice uh, my career for my children. I, that was something that I wasn't interested in. And as a result of that, I probably didn't move up the ladder as quickly as I maybe could have, or as quickly as I saw my male colleagues doing, and um, and that's okay. I've been so fortunate to have the right colleagues around me, to have the right bosses. Everyone, I, I can never tell you of a time of a boss, male or female, and I've probably had, I've definitely had more male bosses than female bosses, but. Regardless, um, all of them supported my life outside of my job, uh, and that was so that was that was so important to me. Um, I've always been able to have team members with me who also supported me and were understanding, mm. and I'm hopeful that I can now now promote that for those individuals. I'm also really thankful that I could start checking my email from home about 20 years ago because sure. you know, 30 years ago that that wasn't a thing that we could do. So that that helped. And the other thing I would say I've had more male mentors than female mentors. Um and and one of them in particular always told me to hire people smarter than me. And I'll tell you yeah. what, you do that and your job gets a whole lot easier, not because of anything else than they think of things that you don't think of. And you can um, work with them and 
they get the job done the first time around. And, you know, it's just, it's so gratifying to really, you're, you're leading them, you're mentoring them and, and how wonderful that is to be able to do. Um, you know, again, from a male perspective, um, I, I, in the organization I'm in right now, the person at the very top of the finance ladder, so to speak, is a female. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I look at that and I'm blessed to be in an organization that has a leadership structure that's very well balanced, in my opinion. So I have never felt that there's a glass ceiling. I have felt that in other organizations. Um, yeah. it, where I am currently, I certainly don't feel that at all. And it, it's, it is also possible that the reason why I felt that in past organizations is because where I was uh, from a parent perspective, as you mentioned at the beginning, my kids are old now in comparison. So, uh, you know, I don't have to leave early to go to a soccer game and, and things like that. So it's much easier than it was several years ago. The other, the downside of all of it, um, I, I learned terribly how to multitask, which I, I'm actually trying very hard to stop multitasking and, and be more mm. focused and, and present. Um, but the cool thing is my children have learned about hard work, independence, sacrifice, and ultimately dedication, whether, you know, dedication to the task at hand, the task that is in front of you. So, you know, yeah, it's male dominated. I think that you would um, say that, you know, 10 years ago, the physician landscape was probably male dominated. Mm -hmm. um, and 20 years ago, maybe 30 years ago, more so, you'd say that it was white male dominated. And mm -hmm. I think you're seeing so many aspects of healthcare in general changing and, and all sorts of walks of life being able to move in, in all various places and, and spots. And as a result, I think that the care that we provide patients is, is better. We're able to see the patient differently. It was a lot. <laughs> no, it, it is. And it's great. And, and I, and I do think that the increasing diversity of, um, the, the, the healthcare leadership and staff and, and all roles, uh, enables us to be more well-rounded in the care we give. And, and of course I'm saying that not as a caregiver myself, but, um, th there are a lot of very true things when it comes to uh, cultures and, and mm -hmm. language barriers and, and all sorts of stuff that we need to overcome in healthcare. And I think that we're continuing to do good work and we probably have a ways to go. And speaking of a, a ways to go, one of the things in there that you mentioned I wanted to ask your opinion on, we, we don't have any data in front of us, but do you think that the change of finance from a, a more male dominated area of healthcare is changing to perhaps more balanced? Because you mentioned your professors were in, in, in finance were female. You mentioned that your current leadership uh, is female. And I think that uh, I'm thinking of other organizations, including mine right now, where a lot of the, the leadership structure in the financial elements uh, are female or at least uh, seemingly better balanced. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's changing? I, and Well, and one of the things I say, I bring that up as a supporting factor anecdote is I know that a lot of the finance realm requires business degrees or accounting certificates and things like this. And I've seen s some data that show that the majority, not a huge majority, but the majority of people going to college now are female, like something like 55, 45. Or, so do you think it's changing? I, I think it is changing. I think the workforce though, in general, it's changing. Mm. So I'm not sure that it's, that it's finance alone. I do think, so at least in, um, in healthcare finance, there are some really cool jobs that you don't necessarily think of as mm -hmm. maybe finance, you know, and there's, there's all right. this data analytics and website building and, and all of these business intelligence tools that have to be created. And um, the individuals doing that don't necessarily have, you know, like a business degree. They have right. different types of degrees. They have degrees that weren't even available when I was in <laughs> school. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, I, I think you are seeing women get into some of those spaces too. And, you know, men and women, it just inherently, we think differently. We interact with data differently. 
Um, I'm, I'm blessed right now within our medical group structure that my partner is a male. And so, you know, I think he and I both, we both, he has a little bit of finance background. I have a little of operational background. And I, I think that we're, we're able to complement each other very nicely mm -hmm. because we do think about scenarios and think about things differently. And I do think it has to do with, with gender. Not all the time, but I think that there's definitely a component of that for sure. Yeah. To the extent that we can get our workforce more balanced to represent and look like what we see in our communities every day, it, it benefits all of us. Yeah. Do you, so if you were talking to a young person, mm. f female or otherwise, but a young person thinking about the healthcare, uh, non-clinical, I'll broaden it out from finance to your point. There's so much data. There's so much IT. There's so much to healthcare these days. Um, thinking of getting into non-clinical areas of healthcare, what advice would you give to that young person? Uh, so interestingly enough, I actually am mentoring a young man right now who's getting ready to graduate from high school, and he's trying to select which college university he wants to go to mm. because he wants to get into hospital administration. And I said, don't necessarily look at getting a degree in hospital administration. There's public mm -hmm. health too, of course, is another you know big uh, degree program that people would get into. And he said, don't necessarily look at that. Get into mm -hmm. something or, or get a degree in something that you enjoy. Get a degree in something that perhaps can be used in many spaces. Because right. one thing to keep in mind always is unless you're a physician or a care provider, you're ultimately overhead. I'm overhead. Right. And so, you know, it, it's so important that, again, that's another reason why we're respectful of our physicians, um, you know, and, and look at that because they're the one. We are here because of them. And mm -hmm. you as a, a young person coming, you know, eventually out of, of, of a college or a degree program, you better be able to be respectful of that individual, of those people who it's it's a symbiotic relationship. Yes, they need you for, for many of the reasons that you mentioned earlier, David, from a regulatory perspective, making sure that the, the dollars that they're generating actually get collected. I mean, there's so many things that they cannot do without us, but we're not there unless they're seeing patients. And right. I, I think that's, it's so important to, to be mindful of that. Um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure that an overall hospital administration degree is something that I would advise um, just because it doesn't translate into, mm -hmm. you end up having to go get into automotive management, you know, or, or some other type of industry. Yep. I, I think that it could be challenging versus having something a little bit more generic that can apply to many things. You can always take that, the, you know, the, additional one or two classes that are healthcare specific, um, you know, and, and kind of go from there. I think that, um, you know, even if you were looking at law, for example, healthcare law, there's so many aspects of healthcare law that again, I'd want to do mm -hmm. something a little bit more generic before I really said, this is going to be my area of expertise. I think that's great advice. And not just because I've given similar advice to, to young folks, uh, myself, I, I, I had somebody ask me at one point, and I forget what the venue was. I, I think it was like a high school career day or something like that. And it was, um, I said, well, how married are you to the idea of getting into healthcare? Because unless you are married to it, and I mean in like the till death do us part type of stance, yep. get something that is broad as an undergraduate degree, because healthcare for good or ill is a bit degree heavy. Yeah. Um, and if you love it and get into healthcare and love it, then you can go, there's always a certificate program. There's always a master's. There's always something else that you can go deeper. Um, but you would be better served from a career flexibility standpoint. And in this day and age, who knows what the jobs and landscape will look like 10 years from now, to your point, a lot of the jobs we have now weren't here. You mentioned 20 years ago, I'd say five yeah. years ago yeah. or, or 10, um, and that kind of brings me into the next topic, which is folks outside our industry may not understand how uh, complex uh, these roles are and careers that are available. But I also think that people have a hard time getting a handle on the size of our of entities and organizations in our industry. I talked to friends um, 
and they work for, uh, you know, a company and they're like, oh yeah, we're, you know, a hundred million dollar company. We're getting pretty big. And I'm like, I, I, that's like the smallest of small hospitals. Right. And, and, you know, there's a lot of hospitals that are multi-billion dollar organizations and even not even publicly traded ones and the publicly traded ones are huge themselves. And then you have the insurers, which are bigger still. And so from the, a bit of the career standpoint, as well as just sort of the job profile standpoint, how do you get your head around and keep your hands around an organization that's as big? I mean, I know that just the medical group, the physician group inside of Bon Scores Mercy Health is hundreds of millions of dollars in size. And, and you're the financial lead for that. How do you keep your hands around it? That's a great question. I, um, I can remember really each time I moved from job to job and it, you know, the scope of responsibility gets a little bit bigger, gets a little bit bigger and mm -hmm. thinking, and, and actually at one point in time asking a predecessor, of, so how exactly do you look <laughs> at, you know, a hundred physician practices? Well, our organization is, we have closer to 800 practice sites. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, the biggest challenge really is we have so much data. We have data that's inside of data that's inside of, I mean, we have data for data for data. It's unbelievable how much data is out there. And, you know, so really trying to understand what data is the most important, what triggers are the most mm -hmm. impactful is, is what you have to keep and be mindful of. And, and it, it's trial and error, one. Two, it changes. Mm -hmm. It changes as time goes on. You are plugged into various industry resources um, who may, you know, kind of publish something that says, hey, have you looked at this before? And that's, you know, of course, something that you take a look at and, and do those things. But, um, you know, you, you look at benchmarks. I'm a huge fan of benchmarks. I'm a huge fan of looking at those benchmarks, finding out who's doing it the best, asking those people, how are you doing it? And mm -hmm. then replicating it because there's no reason for us not to. Um, there's so much waste as, uh, you know, as everybody knows, it's, you know, in, in every, every time you pick up an article or, you know, listen to the news <laughs> about healthcare, there's waste. And if we were a little bit more collaborative, perhaps there would be some waste that would be taken out of that. Um, you know, some of the other things that I listen, I, I keep an ear to the ground is what are my physicians saying? What are the patients mm. saying? What are staff saying as concerns? Because they're the ones who are actually seeing it. I'm seeing the numbers and I can tell you all different, I could surmise all different kinds of stories based upon the numbers. But once I hear the stories that are real and can back into those numbers, it may tell me, oh, we, even though our staff looks appropriate, maybe we don't have the right staffing mix. We have too many of one type of job and not enough of another type of job right. or, you know, just those, those little things that you can't see. But the other piece of course, is I look at the income statement and what's the key driver. And again, like we've been hearing for the last gosh, nearly two years now, supply chain staffing have been the challenges. And mm -hmm. so those are the areas right now, I think most are, are really digging into one thing about being um, a financial leader in healthcare is I have the privilege and opportunity to make a mistake. And no one is going to die if I make a mistake, unlike my clinical right. partners. So, you know, it's a luxury. Um, I can make a mistake, figure out I made the mistake, write it and, and try something different. We can do trial and error. Um, and I think that those are, it, it is, it's a luxury. There's no other way to put it. Um, but again, looking at benchmarks, really um, being able to pull things up and look at the highest levels and then start to slowly parse things out has definitely been helpful. But the other thing that we do in our organization is we do go um, kind of practice location by practice location once a year and mm -hmm. we dig through every single metric you can possibly think of and create action plans around every one of them. And then it's about the accountability that occurs, uh, you know, month over month, year over year with the individuals who are those leaders. 
How do you prevent data overload? You, I mean, you just mentioned going by all these practices and you said you got like 800 of them and you said earlier data sets inside of data sets and how do you prevent data overload and, and just sort of analysis paralysis? Yeah, yeah, and I think that we, um, you know, so the, a, a great example would be you request some analysis for the last month because, you know, there was an anomaly in the data or, you know, there was an mm-hmm. anomaly in your financial statements. So then now that report's getting generated every month. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so it, it's an opportunity to kind of inventory those things from time to time, say who's actually looking at it. It might have been relevant at one point in time. It's no longer relevant. Let's get back to basic blocking and tackling. I think it's important to do that. Not necessarily every year, but I do think that you need to make sure that you haven't gone so far off of kind of the beaten path that you are still doing your basic blocking and tackling, which will accomplish a majority of what you're doing and that you don't get lost in the data, that you don't, um, you know, kind of get yourself buried. But that's where I have the privilege of having a lot of really excellent team members Mm -hmm. at various levels. Some of them are right out of college. Some of them have been doing their job for a handful of decades. And so knowing which, ha- you know, what their strengths and weaknesses are and being able to hone in on those, they're the ones who are gonna help elevate those various challenges or concerns and eventually work them out. Um, and and mm-hmm. leaning on them and really, uh, I've always said that having a team and I've always been blessed, but having the team, it's like a football team. You, each one of them has their own position. They could all have the same title, Roll. but each one has their own position and their, their own areas of expertise. And to be able to leverage that helps you get through all this data. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. And, and particularly as we get into, you know, physicians are becoming not just specialists, but subspecialists. I think data is headed the same way, not just some sort of, uh, you know, it used to be, you know, if you could work Excel, you were you were an analyst and now you have to have more advanced capabilities. And I think currently or certainly in the future, it's going to get even more narrow than that. And it's going to continue oh, yeah. to to segment and and um, that, that, that may be where we're headed. Yes. Um, another element of uh, that that we just kind of talked about in terms of keeping your hands around an organization and, and the role and, and, and again, kind of a blend with your current role and career profile here is I, I have heard often that the a, a trope that CFO is often CF no. You know, you have to be very <laughs> used to telling people no. And earlier in the call, you mentioned about having to say no to doctors. Hey, I want the new shiny MRI. It's $20 million or whatever. And you got to say no because maybe it's not affordable. Mm-hmm. Um. Were you a? Do you feel like that trope of CF no is true, and B, regard true or not, um, but certainly more useful if it's true, um, is have you always been good at saying no to people, or have you had to work on that as a skill? I think yes, it probably is CF no, um, and the reason why I say that is because most of the people that I have to say no to, I only interact with infrequently compared to Mm -hmm. their operations people that they're working with daily or near daily. And I would Mm -hmm. much rather that they have a relationship with those people that feels like they can say yes. It's a good cop, bad cop. And I'm okay with being the bad cop. Um, No, I have not always been comfortable with this. And it has taken a lot of work. Again, going back to my dad's a doctor. um, Mm -hmm. The, you know, I had, my dad has always been for me, he's he's always been on a pedestal for me for lots of reasons. But Mm -hmm. my dad too, he's a doctor. Um, And in his specialty too, I, I, just always kind of thought of him this way. And so then when I had to start interacting with some different physicians of all various specialties, various backgrounds, or, you know, you name it, um, Mm -hmm. and having to say no, and some of them were not very nice. (laughs) (laughs) Um, you know, and it, it, 
it I'll, I'll be honest, there have definitely been days I've always been thankful that when I've had those difficult conversations, I've been in an office where I could close my door so I could catch my breath and, mm. uh, you know, get my feet back underneath me. Um, mm -hmm. Because it is, it's hard. It's hard work. There's no question. Um, it just because you've been doing it longer doesn't make it any easier. Um, mm. But I think you start to understand perspectives differently. And I think you start to get better at the whys of saying no. Um, but yeah, it probably is CF no. <laughs> I, I don't think I've ever heard that though, actually. So. Oh, really? Oh, well, I, I've. <laughs> Uh, I, I've I've heard it for a few years now, and and um, I've I've thought that it is a mostly accurate <laughs> term, but probably not always accurate. And I think that's just because that's that's sort of the archetype of what that role is. Yeah. It's supposed to have that mind on the stewardship and sustainability of the organization, and yeah. um, and that has to be slotted into other values and other team members, as we've been talking about, and their values and their priorities, and and. You know the group has to have a consensus, but but yeah, it's often I think that the CF the CFO either because they have to or because they're good at it or because they're willing to uh, ends up playing that bad cop role and the good cop bad cop. It, it's just it's it's an archetype, and so within that, let's let's look for another piece of advice for for people out there, not just early in their career, but maybe just if somebody's listening and they're like, I'm not good at saying no. <laughs> But I want to be better at it because I think that saying no is a lot. I mean, that's allegedly that's one of Warren Buffett's keys to strategy is knowing what to say no to. Right. Yeah. Um, it is I don't know if he's actually quoted as that or people just attribute to him. But either way, the art of and the ability to say no can be extremely useful. And maybe there's somebody listening who's not that good at it. So since you've had to grow into that and do it more often, and it's a mostly true trope uh, for you. What advice would you have to people who want to get better at saying no? Uh, yeah, the, oh, that's a great question. Um, and, and many things are coming to mind as you ask the question. One, I, I have been able to build on my experiences. So I did have a lot of operational experience before I moved into finance. So I do understand mm. many aspects about how how a hospital runs, how a physician's practice runs. So that, so having the experience, um, calling a bluff, so to speak, uh, you know, that mm -hmm. certainly has helped um, being or developing confidence in the reason why I'm saying mm -hmm. no. Am I saying no because, because I want to or because it really is the right thing to do? And if it really is the right thing to do, why is that? Now, interestingly mm -hmm. enough, I've been on I've, I've been in conversations with one of my colleagues um, who is not in finance. And I'm the one who's saying, no, we need to give the physician a raise. And the other person mm -hmm. is saying, no, we, we, we can't we can't afford to do it. And I'll say mm -hmm. we can't afford not to. You know, so I mean, you, right. you have to know. Um, or develop the history, the, um, the and and the confidence to be able to say no. I mean, look, it's it's difficult for any of us who are parents. We don't like saying no to our kids, but mm -hmm. we know it's the right thing to do mm -hmm. most of the time. Sometimes we sure. know because <laughs> it's it's because we need to say no. But you know, th there are other times like you know. Do they want an extra serving of dessert at the end of the day? And you can say no, but really what's the hurt? And it's the same thing. You got to pick those battles too when you're in, in, mm -hmm. in your career is be careful when you say no, um, because you want to make sure that when you say no, you're not going to be turning around to say yes. The other, the other piece that I had to learn is if I was in more of a, a, a political situation perhaps, and nice. I knew that the person I was going to say no to was going to do an end round and, and try and go to various other parties to get their yes, that I would make sure and go to those parties first to let them know, mm. this is what I'm going to say. This is why I'm saying it. I need to make sure that when that person comes in and asks you the same thing, that you're either going to say, you know, defer to Olivia or, you know, I'm out of the conversation, whatever. And uh, that that was something else that took me a little bit to learn and figure out who all the various stakeholders would be when I was going to say no. 
I think that's really important. I think folks under undercount or under do not take into full consideration the the politics of the modern workplace when you know the post out there in the world or social media or whatever just write articles whatever and for me I, I think what you said there rang true about hey you need to know your why you need to pick your battles do we really need to say no or is this one we can let go etc but um, you mentioned about sort of reaching out ahead of time to folks but uh, uh, the sibling of that to me is um, I've heard friends in the military call it top cover, but making sure your boss has your back. Right. You don't want to be out on a limb yeah. and be like, no, no, no. And, and not be aware of your, where your boss stands right. because you need their backing often to get things done um, or to not have to reverse course. And in which case, why didn't you just say yes, if you're going to reverse course. Exactly. So I think n- knowing those elements and communicating those elements, as you've said, and as I've mentioning, but I think this, the subtext of that point is if you're not sure, if you don't have your why, is this a battle worth fighting and you don't know where other people stand, be willing to take a pause, if you, if you, assuming you can, and come back to it. You know, If you have somebody, whether it's a physician you're interacting with or in your, you're in manufacturing and it's the shift supervisor or whatever – why don't hang on? Let me do some research and come back to you. You know, so, take a pause. Yes. I think being willing and able to do that is really critical to empowering your ability to say no. Oh, you're absolutely right. And and um, how many times I had to learn to do that too, and not have an impulsive reaction, but mm-hmm. to do exactly that. Take a step back. And again, that goes back to that interaction earlier on that we were talking about uh, uh, developing the relationship with a the physician. They go ahead. They ask the question to not, even though you might know right away in your brain, you're like, there's no way this is gonna work. <laughs> but you can't and you shouldn't react immediately, but instead you need to go do that due diligence mm-hmm. in particular before you say the no. And having the air cover, absolutely spot on. You have to have the air cover because otherwise you're exactly right. You're gonna say no and they're gonna know every time that they're, that they're ultimately gonna be able to get the yes. Yep, absolutely. Well, Olivia, I've really enjoyed the conversation, both just educating some folks about the complexity of your universe and and uh, the physician group, um, medical group landscape today and in modern healthcare, as well as some of your career journey and your perspectives and some advice um, for people out there as well. So I think we got a, a good uh, good amount of ground covered today. So thank you for being willing to come on and be out here on the internet for everybody to see, and I hope they get something from it. David, I appreciate very much the invitation and have really enjoyed the conversation. All right, and with that, we'll have a good one. We'll see everybody on the next episode. Bye now. Thank you.